2020 has been a year like no other in living memory. COVID-19 is the biggest biological threat to the world in 100 years. Social distancing, isolation, borders closed, quarantine, working from home, returning to work, and the threat of a potential next wave. And the virus has plunged some of the world's strongest economies into recession, with millions out of work. Add to this protests and unrest across the globe, you could be forgiven for thinking the world is tearing itself apart. Humans have faced major challenges before, but what effect can all this uncertainty have on our mental health? How can that affect our immune system? And how can you maintain well-being in order to get through this crisis? In this special episode, we explore stress, the immune system, and feeding your brain. Hello, I'm Steve Iloff, and this is Altura Now. Delia McCabe, PhD, is a nutritional and neuroscience researcher. She's written two books, Feed Your Brain, Seven Steps to a Lighter, Brighter You. It's the ultimate guide to getting your brain in tip-top condition simply via the foods you eat. It includes healthy and delicious recipes. And Delia's second book, Feed Your Brain, The Cookbook, adds more great recipe ideas. Both books are available online. You can order through Amazon and Apple Books. Delia joins me now. Welcome, Delia. Hi, Steve. Thank you for the invitation. It's great to have you with us. Your background is in psychology, but nutritional neuroscience piqued your interest. What led to that? It's an interesting story. I was busy um, doing my master's in psychology and I was looking at a group of um, school children, some of whom were doing very well at school and others who were doing poorly. And I had a bit of extra space on, on one of the questionnaires that I asked them to fill in. And the question was um, that, that I included in that extra space was, you know, what is your favorite food? And every child in the group of children who were really battling to do well at school and focus and concentrate, that, that, that was my experimental group, every one of those children loved junk food. Whereas my control group who were smart and doing well at school didn't, you know, provide the same answers. And that really piqued my, my interest. Of course, there were other variables involved in their lack of focus and concentration, but that for me was a huge red flag. And so I decided to investigate that further. And that led to me doing a deep dive into how the brain needs specific nutrients and how we need to feed our brains well to, to you know, to obtain optimal development and, and functioning. It's fascinating where things lead us. Did this come as a surprise to you? It kind of came as an evolution because I thought to myself over a period of time after I you know, looked at, at the, the, the evidence, I said to myself, you know, if you're trying to talk someone better and they come to you for therapy and their brain isn't really well nourished, how effective is that therapy going to be? How effective are they going to be at making changes, you know, changing habitual behaviors, thinking new thoughts, changing their lives? And I came to the conclusion that you wouldn't have as good an outcome if their brain was well nourished. So it was a process of evolution for me to shift from being a, a talking therapist to being someone who wanted to say, hey, you know, what did you have for breakfast? So everything's interrelated, exercise, diet, mindfulness. If we live a healthy lifestyle, we will generally function how we should? Absolutely. And I think part of the problem that, that med medicine has had for many, many years, but not anymore, not, not with enlightened physicians, is that people used to see things as separate. And you know, even when people speak now about boosting the immune system, I really hate that term because the immune system is part of the whole system and you can't separate the brain from the body. And, and people trying to you know, make these silos of, of specificity for different body systems is really very archaic because everything works together. And the brain, of course, being the primary survival organ is very greedy in terms of nutrients. So making sure that it is well nourished became the focus of my research. With everything going on in the world at the moment, there's a great deal of stress out there. Could you explain what is stress and what is its biological function? Well, the illustration that I like to use, Steve, is to try and get people just to imagine that we're walking through the forest and it's a beautiful day. The sun is you know, drifting through all the leaves dappled sunlight, there are birds in the distance, it's just a lovely day and we're having a walk down this path that we've traveled many times before, but suddenly we hear a rustle in the bushes and before we can even think, could it be a tiger, we're already running because just keep in mind that emotion travels faster in the brain than thought does and this is a survival mechanism. 
So now we're running away from that rustle in the bushes that we thought could have been a tiger before we even thought it could have been a tiger. Now, if you extend that analogy to today, we are continuously being faced with a stressor that we don't understand, but we're trying to run away from it, trying to run away from it, um, and we can't. You know, when we were walking in the forest and it turned out that it wasn't actually a tiger, we, we slowed down. We walked slowly again. You know, we enjoyed the sunshine again. It was a good day. It wasn't a tiger. We were lucky, we were fortunate, and we were pleased. Today, this tiger isn't appearing in most people's lives, but the fear is there. It's overwhelming. We don't know what to do with it. And unfortunately, with this kind of fear, which, it, which, is, which leads to chronic stress, it's got a number of very negative effects on the body because the body was not intended to deal with the stress response for longer than 30 to 60 seconds. But what happens if the stressful event is prolonged and the stress becomes chronic and you feel like you have no control? What does that do to your system? Well, this is, this is where it gets to be kind of like a sobering conversation because what happens over time is the body is trying to adjust. It's trying to find a new homeostasis. So the brain's always on alert. And this means that it will affect your immune system firstly, because just think back to the walk with the tiger in the forest. When your brain perceives a danger that could lead to your demise, it immediately starts sending to your muscles glucose firstly to run away from the threat or to fight it. And secondly, sends information to your cells that you could actually suffer from a physical um, impairment. You could be attacked. You could, it could lead to, to blood loss. You could hurt your body. And so an inflammatory response is set up. And this is just to make sure that if you get an infection, your body can fight it. Now, if the tiger does bite you and you manage to survive, that inflammatory response is very useful and can save your life. If the tiger doesn't attack, attack you, that inflammatory response stops immediately when you realize it's not a tiger and you carry on walking down the path. Today, this chronic stress leads to that inflammatory response being raised all the time. And over time, the immune system becomes worn down. Your body cannot continue fighting something that doesn't actually exist and doesn't come to an end. So the, our ability to manage stress and to manage what we eat to keep our blood glucose stable is extremely important under these conditions because our body is actually under more pressure and, and more wear and tear than it would normally be because the stress isn't ending. The other challenge um, with chronic stress is that eventually the limbic system, this is part of the brain that, that modulates our emotions, <clears throat> this part of the brain becomes damaged in the sense that it feels a sense of fear and a fear of overwhelm um, and it doesn't feel like it can cope because this is an uncontrollable fear. It's, it doesn't have an end in sight. So what happens is that our emotions become difficult to manage. So people that experience chronic stress eventually can become very much more anxious and depressed than people that haven't experienced chronic stress because of those shifts, those actual physical changes that happen within the limbic system. And this is a concern for me because with the, with the present state of stress, this, this rate of depression and anxiety can escalate um, when, when this um, challenge is over. The third thing to keep in mind is that when uh, you have a very quick um, stress response and it's over. You know, you walk in the forest, it wasn't a tiger, you carry on walking, you all calm again. That is a very different stress to what we're experiencing. And it's not just the hypothalamus pituitary adrenal access that's being activated now. What's happening is that our brain is constantly also um, sending input to the prefrontal cortex. This is the part of the brain. This is the CEO of the brain. And it's saying to the prefrontal cortex, hey, you know, is there a pattern occurring here? It, it, is there something that we can do? What are the consequences of, of what's going on around us? Um, you know, can we make a plan for what's going to happen? And because there are no answers in the particular challenge we find ourselves in, this leads to the prefrontal cortex, you know, kind of like going backwards and forwards, backwards and forwards with, with the HPA stress response, trying to find some clarity. And this, of course, leads to, leads to what we can see around us presently is a lot of conspiracy theories because the brain is always looking to create a pattern. The brain wants to find a solution. The brain is primed to do that. That enhances our chances of survival. So the prefrontal cortex also being continuously engaged with the stress response is the, the added negative to this ongoing chronic stress. And very few people address this because they don't actually understand that chronic stress does activate the prefrontal cortex on an ongoing basis. 
So we're going to chat about that a little bit later about bringing some control back into our lives so that we can calm the HPA and give our prefrontal cortex something to do that's positive. So when we're faced with that tiger in the forest, we have adrenaline, cortisol, all sorts of things happening in our body so that we can respond to the threat. But in the modern world, this is not serving us very well, unless of course we're walking down a dark alley at night, it could be helpful there. Um, but because we can't respond to stress the way we are biologically meant to in a lot of modern situations, uh, is the modern world part of the problem? It's a great question and it's a, it's, it's a kind of a complex question because you know our brains evolved for two primary reasons, to keep us alive so that we can breed. And so, it's a, the stress response is a really ancient response and it's a beautifully orchestrated response for immediate physical threat. And as you've just pointed out, the modern world is a very different place. You know, we sit in traffic, we can't move. You know, we have stress at work, we can't shout at the boss. Now we have to work at home, but we still have to answer to that same boss. These are all the kind of stresses, including, of course, you know, the, the COVID stress, which is complete and, and absolute uncertainty. So we haven't actually experienced this kind of stress as a generation. There are very few people that are still alive today who have lived through a, an extremely traumatic experience. For example, like a world war, a great depression. All of those circumstances force people to find a resiliency and find a way to manage through the crisis. We haven't had that. This is the first time that many people have been exposed to a challenge like this. So we are being pushed to, to find ways of coping and ways of being in this brave new world where we now have to find a new normal. So nobody has all the answers, Steve, at all. Nobody does. But we do know that our brain is not really equipped to cope with ongoing stress, chronic stress, unrelenting stress optimally it will have physical effects and if we can find ways to ameliorate those physical effects and obviously the the psychological effects then we'll be helping to lift this burden that we don't know the long-term effects of i suppose it's about taking steps to be kind to yourself isn't it uh, there's a there's a cycle that happens when we feel like we're not coping when we feel like we have no control we start doing things that make us feel comfortable uh, we start comfort eating, we reach for high energy foods, uh, or self-medicating, which tend to ex exacerbate the issue, don't they? Managing our diet to keep our blood glucose as stable as possible will firstly reduce the stress um, uh, level to, to some degree because every time your blood glucose goes up and down, you also release cortisol. But also it will help you have less of a craving for the kinds of foods that most people reach for when they look for emotional, you know, emotional eating. Um, to make themselves feel better. So maintaining our blood glucose is extremely important. But another thing to do is just keep in mind that when you have all that adrenaline in your body because you stress, the perfect thing to do with it is to exercise because you're actually using up that adrenaline then in a very positive way. You're actually running away from the tiger, so to speak. So you're helping your body use the adrenaline in a very positive way instead of reaching for that packet of crisps. I'd, I'd like to remind people just to think about the fact that human beings are very resilient and we're very creative. And we have weathered severe storms before. And I think we need to be kind to ourselves and realize that we need to nourish and nurture ourselves, but we still need to be firm enough to be able to stick to routines that will serve us long term. Because there's no point in coming to the end of this challenge and then finding yourself battling severely with mental health, maybe being very unfit, maybe having put on a lot of weight, because then we have to rebuild a number of things probably in our society and in our economy. And we're not going to be well equipped to do that if we're battling with all the negatives that we can allow to, to pull us down in this situation. Or otherwise, we can just say, you know, this is an opportunity to become the best version of myself that I can be. And I would encourage people to think about it as a positive opportunity in a terribly demanding and challenging situation. What are some of the things that we can do to minimize the effect of stress on the immune system? Well, I'll firstly put my psychology hat on and say that we need to find things in our day-to-day -day life that we are in control of. And we're in control of our time and how we spend our time, firstly. So what I suggest people do before they go to bed at night, have a little notepad next to their bed and write down three things that you want to accomplish the next day, which have got nothing to do with work. Whatever they are, write them down. And when you get up the next day, stick to a routine, wake up at the same time, 
do all the tasks that you need to do and also accomplish those three things. This gives you a number of benefits because while you're accomplishing those three things, you are distracting yourself from negative repetitive thoughts. You're also busy accomplishing something. The brain likes to have a goal. And thirdly, when it's finished, you have a sense of satisfaction and confidence and you see that you actually are capable of changing things. So that's the first thing that I suggest people do. Find something that you have control over and exert control over that. And the second thing, which I think we're going to be discussing in some more detail, Steve, is to make sure that your diet is really excellent. Because what a lot of people don't realize is that adrenaline is expensive to produce in relation to nutrients. Producing adrenaline and cortisol is expensive and leads to them feeling exhausted. And it does that because adrenaline and cortisol are survival hormones. If your body has to choose between making those hormones to run away from the tiger or making neurotransmitters like serotonin and melatonin, which help you sleep, it's definitely going to choose the survival um, hormones versus the calm and soothing hormones because it wants you to survive for long enough to be able to breed. So the bottom line is that when your diet is really good, you can supply nutrients for adrenaline and sorry, adrenaline and, and cortisol synthesis, and you'll also have enough left over to make the, the other neurotransmitters that we need to keep our mood balanced. So taking control over what we can take control over from a psychological perspective, and secondly, making sure that our diet is really, really good so that we can produce all the nutrients, sorry, produce all the compounds that we need to, to be able to keep ourselves healthy. The media is so pervasive at the moment with so much happening in the world, and it's not just COVID-19. It seems we're being hit with more catastrophic news every day. Is that having an effect on us? Absolutely, the media is having a huge effect on people. And it's not just the media, it's also social media. So people are getting an onslaught of information and many of, most of the information is actually not helpful. It doesn't help for us to be stressed about what's happening in another country. It doesn't mean that we're not being compassionate. It doesn't mean that we don't care. It means that we have to look after our own mental health and be responsible for the mental health of our family and our team members before we get ourselves concerned about a situation that we can't control. And if we can just go back for one moment, Steve, if you think about your circle of control and your circle of concern, there are two very, very different circles, if we can think about it that way. There are many, many things in the world that we cannot control, and COVID-19 is one of them. We have absolutely no control over how it's going to play out unless in our circle of concern we see we can definitely do all the things that we've been advised to do to minimize infection rates. So we have some control over that. But watching the news and all the things we can't control just adds to the poor brain's onslaught of too much information. So I'm suggesting that people make a certain time every day where they watch the news and it definitely shouldn't be first thing in the morning because that sets the tone for your whole day and your brain's got the whole day to worry and be stressed. Maybe make it at lunchtime. Spend 15 minutes finding information from a news source that can be trusted not from somebody who's making up a conspiracy theory about how things occurred, how things are unfolding and what the end result looks like. Just get the facts. When you get the facts, you're much better able to deal with anything else. So when the day is over and it's time to shut out the world, what's the best approach? I love this question. The best approach to do is not sit in front of TV and watch Netflix shows that are gonna stress you more. The best thing to do is find comedians so that you can laugh and there's a very good physiological reason for this, actually a neurobiological reason. We have a sympathetic nervous system and we have a parasympathetic nervous system. Now the sympathetic nervous system is in charge of our stress response. So it's involved with hypothalamus, pituitary, adrenal activity and the way we respond to stress. In other words, the SNS is what jumps up when the tiger or when we think the tiger is rustling in the bushes. The parasympathetic nervous system does the opposite. It calms us down, it helps us digest our food, it allows us to go to sleep. The challenge we have today is that most people are involved in the SNS. Everyone's on high alert, everyone's vigilant, everyone's concerned, anxious, and stressed. This is not the state to stay in if you want health. We need to activate our parasympathetic nervous system. And this is where comedians can help us. When you're laughing and you're enjoying a joke and you're watching a comedian and you find what he's saying funny or what she's saying funny, your parasympathetic nervous system steps in. In fact, your sympathetic nervous system can't function when you're laughing. So. I suggest people spend a lot of time in their evenings enjoying the funny things in life. 
so that their parasympathetic nervous system can step up and they can they can sleep better. Does that mean I can go and watch reruns of Frasier before I go to bed? Absolutely. And I think that's a grand idea because that, that really helps us. It, it, firstly, it distracts us from the news that can really be overwhelming. And secondly, your PNS has no choice. It has to step up. So you basically push aside the stress um, and, and, and you laugh and, and, and it's really good for you. You talk about the parasympathetic nervous system and relaxation, so having a bath with magnesium, some bath salts, fragrances, uh, or being out in nature. Um, what are the options? Because meditation is not for everyone, is it? I like, I like what you said about having a bath with magnesium. It's a really good way to unwind at the end of the day. And there is some evidence to show that transdermal magnesium absorption is really good. Um, and also that magnesium is very much involved in adrenaline synthesis. So having magnesium is, is, is a really good thing. And you get that also by eating a lot of greens. The other thing that I suggest people do is try to find a smell that they really like. And personally myself, I have got a, a special citrus blend that I have in the shower and I put it on my hands. And when I breathe it in, I make an intention and I start my day like that. And I like smell because smell is intimately linked with memory because our olfactory bulb lies right next to our hippocampus. So that's why when you smell a certain smell, it can take you straight back to the place that you first smelled it. If people have a very special smell that they can link to a place or a time or a person that soothes them and calms them, I suggest that they do that. And throughout this time, it also helps you to become mindful because you smell that smell and it just takes you back to that decision you made or that time which can calm you down. I think you know, your, your comment about meditation is true. If people haven't been practicing meditation up until this point in time, they can feel that it's, you know, it's overwhelming and it's daunting. And especially with all these thoughts that keep on going around in our, in our head, not meditating is not the worst thing in the world if you haven't practiced it yet. If you can start practicing it, fantastic. But if you're not practicing it yet, I suggest that people just start being mindful. It's really a case of learning to control our thinking versus allowing our emotions to run run wild. It's just a point of getting to that place and making the decision that that's what you're choosing to do versus staying in a highly stressed state. So it's about finding your own way to relax? I think it is. I think all of us are different. I think all of us find the, the one thing that really soothes us. I know a number of people who enjoy going into the forest and we can do that today. As Without long as the we... tiger. <laughs> Yeah, there are no tigers yet, thank goodness. But yes, you know, as long as we, we um, adhering to social distancing, being in green surroundings is wonderful. So if you've got a back garden, sit out in that back garden, look at the green leaves. Green is very, very soothing for the brain. So that's a great idea as well. If you've got a swimming pool, go and sit at the swimming pool, put your feet in the water, enjoy those moments. Take those moments of a respite from this ongoing feeling of, of a lack of control. And yes, as you say, everyone has their own particular way of unwinding. The one thing that I would suggest people don't get very attached to is alcohol, because alcohol can take away the immediate um, feeling of, of, you know, stress and overwhelm. But unfortunately, it's a central nervous system depressant too. So the next morning people wake up and then they feel worse. And then they've got to battle that feeling um, to be able to overcome that feeling and to get a get a handle on the day. So I would suggest that Alcohol does not become a crutch. Rather find something else that does that for you. And you may have to go through a few things to, to discover what that is. Um, for me, I love smell. Um, I also have a little ball that I use when I'm standing at my desk because I've got a standing desk and I just use that to rub on my hands. And just the sensory experience of that really feels good for me. And it brings me back to the moment once again. So I think everybody needs to find their own special thing and then just stick to it. And you know, these habits of thinking become neural pathways. So if you want to enhance your mental health, generally speaking, you need to learn to create neural pathways that lead you to feel more in control and calmer. Because if you do the opposite, when this catastrophe is over, you will find that those neural pathways will still be there. You'll be much more vigilant. You'll be much more fearful. You'll be able to experience that stress response just at the blink of an eye and that's what we want to get away from we want to create neural pathways that can support us through this challenge and this current challenge is far from over so looking after yourself really is an important thing to keep top of mind 
Well, that's part one of this Altura Now special. We've covered what stress is and how it affects the body. We've also talked about relaxation and mindfulness tips. Check out Delia's books and connect with her on social media and subscribe to Altura Learning's YouTube channel. Also connect with us on various social media platforms. In part two, we discuss the benefits of even light exercise and, of course, the importance of healthy eating for a healthy immune system. See you soon.